Okay. I'll try to, I'll try to. Thank you very much for the invitation. So please uh, talk and interact and uh, interrupt me and ask questions. So I've been preparing a Beamer file, which is a good point and, and, and not so good point because I'm, I'm a bit afraid that I might go too fast. So please, 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 this is just a support for us to discuss, let's say. Okay. So yes, the, the, the purpose of this talk was to somehow convince you that higher structures are mandatory. So don't be afraid. I'm going to give you quite many definitions. And I, the way I, I prepared this talk was to somehow show you that when you want to prove theorems or formulate theorems, you definitely need to, to put your hands into higher structures. So let's see how this works. So I think I divided the, the talk into three big parts. Of course, I want to, to cover and to record the classical structures, otherwise you will not appreciate the higher ones. Uh, then there's going to be the operatic calculus. This is something I, I like to somehow I coined that myself. Uh, some people told me, oh, but Operad is not a theory, it's just, it's just a tool. Sure, it's a tool. So Operad, the Operad stuff is, is meant to be, uh, for algebraic structures, what uh, differential calculus is to, to manifold. So it's definitely that, to develop a universal calculus. And if you think of it that way, well, that is great. And then I would like to go to something I'm excited in recently, this highly theory. And there are much, many, many things to say behind that. But basically, there will be nothing. I mean, the last slide is about Hayali theory, but the other slides are all about deformation theory, quite classical, things you know. But there are things which are quite interesting there. OK, so let's begin. What about the classical structures? So I began <laughs> this, this talk at the beginning of the 20th century uh, with the first say, deformation problem, the problem of classification of topological spaces. Voila. What is topological spaces? Well, you know, these are a uh, space where we can detect when points are close to uh, each other. Okay, fair enough. So for instance, there is a circle, you see on the left-hand side, and there is the, the, the cup that you can see. That's my favorite espresso cup. Bon, and we want to compare these two. Okay, are they the same or are they not the same? So, well, it depends. It depends which kind of equivalence you consider. If you consider the very strong notion of homeomorphism, that is bijections which are to be continuous, well, of course, no. They have no chance to be uh, to be homeomorphic. If they were, you just remove two different points from the circle, you cut your circle into two connected components, but the homeomorphisms preserve the, the connected components. And if you remove two points to my cups, that's okay, you can do that. You do not spoil my cup too much. I don't think you're going to make a hole. And, and then, no, you still have one connected component. OK. But if you ask my son, who's five years old, oh, is the circle the same than, than the cup? After a few minutes, I say, yes, of course they were. Why they were? Because uh, before put them in the oven, when I was trying to, to play with the mold, I mean, I can, I can stretch the, the, the cup, deform it continuously to its ankle. And then, yes, and, and then you get, you get the circle. And that's actually the, the most interesting uh, equivalence relation, okay? So we want to consider the weak equivalence relation, which is the homotopy equivalence. So well, you know the definition, I think. If you don't, keep in mind that it is just you continuously deform uh, your, uh, your object, but you are not alluded to your scissors, okay? You are not alluded to cut. And then uh, now the troubles become because you've just opened Pandora's box. You want to ask yourself, oh, can I classify topological spaces up to homotopy equivalence? Uh, actually, no. This is an amazingly difficult problem. OK, so what do we do when we want to classify things? Well, we want to classify finite dimensional vector spaces. We have a very good guy who's the dimension. And any finite dimensional vector space of dimension 10, well, they are all isomorphic. So cool. So we want to find, uh, oh, sorry. So we want to find faithful invariance, okay, for the topological spaces up to homotopy equivalence. Okay, right. Now uh, there is invariance and there are faithful. Invariance, okay. The, the, the beginning of the 20th century is, is made up of many invariants. So people coined that the homology groups, the cohomology groups, and they were proved to be invariant of the homotopy type. So cool. Well, there is a bright point here, I mean, Say you have two guys, and they do not have the same homology, they cannot be homotopy equivalent. 
So these are very powerful uh, tools for sure. But are they faithful? Homotopy groups, none of them is faithful. Okay. So let's continue with this, this dream, this quest of finding faithful invariants of uh, topological spaces. Then in the middle of the century, uh, Eilenberg and McLean were working very hard on these uh, topological invariants and they came up with the notion of a category. So well, what is a category? For me today is going to be objects, points, and the rows. I want to view them as a monoid but with many base points, okay? If I had a monoid, my monoid would be a rose and it would turn around just one point, okay? And I would be able to compose them. Oh, but no, sometimes my arrows cannot be composed. They can be composed only if the target of one arrow lies at the source of the second arrow. But it's not a big deal. This guy is definitely unital and associative, okay? Well, what was the purpose of Allenberg McLean in 1942, uh, 45? Well, the first purpose was to encode the functoriality of the invariants. But they said, well, you know, everybody knew these, these uh, invariants were functorial, and we knew that. But actually, the, the real goal that we wanted to achieve was, was the notion of a category, was to compare the invariants. We wanted to have a mean to compare them. Uh -huh. But if you try to think one second, what does this mean? It means that what is an invariant? So here I drew top. Ab for abelian groups, so these are the categories. The two invariants, which are the higher homotopy group pi n, and so here n is, is greater or equal to 2, the n homology group, and then you know that you have the Urevich map between the two, so you can compare the two. Oh, and you see, we are already on slide 2, and I already drew a higher category. So already in the original paper of Eilenberg and McLean, it's not the notion of a category which appeared to say so. It's already the higher categorical notion. Already we have two category theory appearing in the very first paper, say, on category theory. So more or less there's, there was no hope that we could uh, stick to only categories. Anyway, so here in this talk, I will talk about two kinds of, say, structures, algebra structures and categorical structures. Of course, they are very much related. So you see, we already saw that there was category theory and maybe tentatively higher category theory. And now I want to address the question of, oh, but maybe we can consider something a bit different, that is algebraic structure. What can we do? Well, you can start with the singular co-chains of a topological space. And there's a very quite simple formula. You glue somehow the co-chains together in some sense. And then, wow, you create the cup product on, uh, on this guy. So, okay, here the good product. And so, uh, the, this guy is definitely associative. The boundary map is a derivation, so this forms a different graded associative algebra. Cool. We can go a bit further. We can say, well, I can look, this is good. As soon as we have such a structure here on the co-chains, which is compatible with the differential, we can go down to the co-set of cohomology the co-product passes to cohomology and it produces a nice associative, now graded, the differential is zero, algebra structure. Oh, yes, but no, it turns out it's stricter than that. It's actually commutative. And why there is a heuristic reason for that is that this commutativity admits a homotopy. There is an operation of degree one, actually, that I denoted by cup one, and which is at the root of the Steno squares. Uh, which takes two co-chains and produces one. And if you look at the formula, the derivative of cup one, which is on the left-hand side of the equal sign of this equation, if you derive cup one, you get exactly the relation you want. That is, cup one is a homotopy for the commutativity. But now that we pass to cohomology, the guy on the left-hand side is killed, and the guy on the right-hand side becomes equal to zero. So you see already, I mean, what we often try to do when we have first classes on, on algebraic topology, we try to compute uh, cohomology algebras. It's, it's good, I mean, these are polynomial algebras. If we can find, say, I don't know, three, four generators, and then we find their relations, good. We have the full cohomology algebra. And the realistic reason is that there are more structures on the, on the co-chain level. Then you can define a Lie bracket on the shifted homotopy groups, and this forms a gradient Lie algebra, it's a whitehead bracket. 
So why did I recall all these three guys? Because we have the three graces of, of, of operatic calculus, associative, commutative, and Lie algebra. But unfortunately, none of them produce a faithful invariant of the homotopy type. They are invariant, but they are not faithful. Okay, there are counterexamples. Too bad. Well, too bad or so good. I mean, uh, it is so good because we still have work to do and very nice things to unravel. Hey man, let's, let's go in this direction. So let's look at the operatic calculus now. So, uh, so forget operat for, for a second, I'm going to introduce them. So if you've never seen that, for, uh, forget even the word itself. Okay. So what do we all do when we want to visit a, a country or a city or whatsoever? I mean, if you have friends who say, well, I'm, I've never done algebraic topology, they're wrong. Everybody has, has, has been studying fundamental group, etc. Why? When you visit a city, what do you do? You start from your hotel, you walk inside the city, and you come back to your hotel at the end of the day, hopefully. Uh, this is exactly what algebraic topologists do. We take a uh, topological space X, boom, we choose a base point, our hotel, and then we walk around. So we consider maps parameterized from zero to one, say, that start from X and they move they, in, in, the, in the topological space X and they finish at X. Fair enough. And we believe that if we understand the loop space of a space, this will give us data about the space itself. Okay. Uh, here, if we have a loop, uh, we cannot contract any, uh, any loop that goes around this hole to X. Okay. And again, when we want to understand topological spaces, the idea that goes back to pff, at least Poincaré even further is to put algebraic structure, associate algebraic structure on that. So what can we do here? Then we can concatenate the path, okay? I have a certain path phi and then a certain path psi. I can, between zero and one half, go along the phi psi, and then phi, and then go along the phi psi. But if we, if we look for a minute, and we, we, we all know that, uh, there is this reparametrization issue. It's not a big deal, strictly speaking. I mean, if we are a bit open-minded, it's not a big deal. If we are, no. So, first question we can ask, it seems to be associative, is it? No way. It is not associative. If we reparametrize the stuff, so the left um, associator is at the top of my, uh, let me try to use the pointer here. So I hope you can see it. So here, what we have is on the top, if we do first f and g, f is going to be between 0 and 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 half, 1 half, 1. And of course, if we consider the composite, oh, wait, OK. Alors, f equals phi, g equals psi, and h equals omega. Hmm? So the two composites are different, but not that much different. There is a homotopy between these two. Okay, we can continuously deform the parameterization to go from the left comb to the right comb. Okay, so this product star is not strictly speaking associative, it is associative up to homotopy. And this is what I try to show with this kind of three wise picture that uh, represents what's going on very well. And of course, now if we pass to loops modulo their homotopies, this relation becomes strict and we get the fundamental group. But again, if we mode out by something, we lose the data. I don't want to lose the data. So I still want to work with the loop space, not the fundamental group. OK, fair enough. Alors, can we have uh, more operations now on this loop space? And let's say I want to consider configurations of the intervals. Sorry, configurations of intervals inside the unit interval. Here, I drew three. Now, I hope you see them. It's a bit tiny in blue, orange, and green, respectively. OK? And now if you give me three loops, oh, I can cook another one out of this data. So out of the data of the configuration of the interval and the three loops. From zero to one tenth, you stay in X, you stay in your hotel. Then from I don't so you apply F1, then you stay in X, then you apply F2, then you stay in X, then you apply F3, then you stay in X. Okay, that's it. Well, wow, good. That's a loop. Huh? That's continuous. No problem. Okay, fair enough. So it, it gives me a new operation. Wow. 
So it gives me a, a, a full bunch of, of operations acting on loop spaces, and not only my star I, I considered before. Bon, ben, good. We have a definition. Now let's see how it behaves on the left-hand side. So what did we consider? On the left-hand side, we considered the set, the topological space, of collections of interval. They have no right to interact except on their boundary. On the right-hand side, what do we have? The space of all operations acting on the loops. That is, continuous maps from loop times n to the loop. Okay. And in some sense, there is an action that should go from this D1. So for those of you who know where I'm going, you know why I chose the notation D1. And this and the morphism of what? Well, now let's look at the simplest one. What is the algebraic structure on, on this n to y? Well, these are just maps and inputs when I put. So I can definitely compose them in the way I know from kindergarten. Okay. So here, what do you do? You compose j, g at the either place of f, and it produces a new map with n plus m minus 1 input and 1 output. Fair enough. And what does this operation satisfy says? It satisfies the sequential axiom. Alors, I should have drawn a picture. Uh, here, what do you do? You take lambda here, you plug mu above, and then in this configuration, so forget the indices I'm going to tell you, you're going to plug nu here at the top of mu. Ah, but okay. So then you could have composed mu and nu first and then lambda. That's why I call that the sequential axiom, okay? It's a kind of associativity, but I definitely don't want to call that associativity. And then there is the parallel axiom, which says, okay, good, I can have a certain lambda. I plug a mu, and then next to it, I plug a, sorry, lambda, mu, and I plug a nu. Hey, I could have plugged nu first and then mu. So this is parallel because you have the two corollas that can come in a parallel way, plugging inside lambda. Cool, that's it. Well, let's call it, let's give this a name. Huh? This is an operad. So an operad is nothing but a collection of SN modules. So here these are just sets or topological spaces with an action of the symmetry group. You permute the inputs. You have a collection of composition maps and they have to satisfy the sequential and parallel axioms. Okay, fair enough. So this is the algebraic structure that we have on the right hand side. What about this D1? And D1 has the same algebraic structure. Now, if you give yourself two configurations of intervals, what can you do? You take a first configuration here of two intervals, and I want to plug at the second interval another configuration. But it's very easy. You just shrink this interval 0, 1 to make it fit inside here, and it gives you that. So I think the, the, the picture is quite uh, explicit. And then you can check. Does this uh, satisfy the axiom of an operat? For sure. You insert and you insert. Either way, it gives you the same result. So what I so this satisfies the sequential and parallel axioms. Okay. And now, what is an algebra of an operat? It's a morphism of operat from a certain operat p to the endomorphism. This is what we had before. Any loop space is a D1 algebra. If you want to, you, you've already seen that before, so let's, let's read the last sentence. This is just multilinear representation theory. What is representation theory? On the left hand side, you have uh, usually an associative algebra, and the right hand side, you have a home from y to y. Here, the new bit is that you have this times n. Well, and what I just said here works for any symmetric monoidal category sets, topological spaces, simple sets different graded module, etc., etc. So here I gave you the example of the dimension one case, but actually you can define this in any dimension. You consider the d-dimensional disk, configurations of disk inside, and then you can compose them by shrinking. Here I drew something in dimension two. So here you're going to insert something at this place. You're going to shrink this disk to make it fit here, and the upshot is this guy, okay, and again, it satisfies the axiom of an operat. So these are the two mothers of, of operat, the little disk operat and the endomorphism operat. And the bright point here is that this is beautiful recognition principle. 
which is at the origin of the introduction of Opera. So we saw one direction. Okay, let's, uh, <laughs> n equals to d here on the right side, I'm sorry. So here, what, say, there's a question. Yes, can I simply ask one question? I'm still a bit, uh, a bit thinking about the previous slides. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not at all familiar with uh, operas, but I am familiar with our infinity algebras. And how you were telling it, it seems to me to be quite similar, but still not. So, I'm, so what's, uh, yes, my question is. It is. What it is uh, uh, infinity I'm, algebras. I'm, alors, uh, I'm going to talk about A infinity algebras in two slides. So, ah, okay, so. they're, they're going to be 10 or 12 slides on A infinity algebras. So, but I don't want okay. to. Okay, sorry, to hide sorry. Another, no, 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 but please ask a question. No, but um, uh, I don't want to hide things under the carpet. Uh, this is not, say, your topological model of A infinity. For you, A infinity is Tashef polytope, okay? And yes. this is another model, if you want, okay? But this is uh, uh -huh. infinitely uh -huh. dimensional, okay? Uh, okay. So okay. Bo both are homotopy equivalents. So it's just okay, another model. Okay. This is another model of the infinity to, to, okay, answer, to address your question. You're welcome. So what I want to say is that, okay, please here read n equals d. And what I showed before, and you have to trust me, uh, is that each time that you have a space, which is an n for, uh, a loop space, it is a d1 algebra. The formula works exactly the same for d any d, not in not necessarily d equals one. But what is very very surprising is the other direction. That is, if you have this algebra expression, you you have the homotopy type of the full space. This is a beautiful result, which uh, tells you how algebraic structures detect the homotopy type. And this is what I've been the kind of question I've been addressing from the beginning. Okay. So it's a beautiful result of Stashev in dimension one, Bowman Fogt and me, so dimension infinity. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so about the inverse direction, so should we uh, also require that pi zero is a group, right? Yes, like yes, 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 yes. Alors, uh, mm -hmm. let me, thank you for your question, Boris. Uh, in this colloquium, I'm, I'm definitely not precise with the statements. And there are assumptions everywhere. But the heuristic is here. So you're right. Thank you very much. Yes. Alors, uh, now let's move to let's move to the to the DG world. So now let's forget the topological world for a second. And let's move to the DG world since you definitely want to see infinity algebras. They are there. Okay. So how do we pass from topological to DG? Well, by taking cellular shapes. Okay. Let me recall something very basic. So don't be annoyed, but I think it is good to recall it. Okay, what have we seen when we were in kindergarten? We knew that if we have two, say, vector spaces, A and H, and if we have isomorphisms between them, we can transport the structures. So let's say I start from a new, which is associative, satisfies the associative relation strictly. You transfer it, which means that now I want a product on H. You go in I, you do the product, and you come back. That is what this mu2 is doing for you, sure? Alors, it's not associative, but associative that you have to write, to read. Um, okay, what's the proof? The proof is very easy, right? You consider the left comb. Then since you plug them, pi is equal to the identity, okay? Now you use the associativity relation for mu, and then this is nothing but the right comb for the transferred guy. Fair enough. Now let's play a little bit. This is an easy theorem, blah, blah, not even a theorem. So, uh, anyway, now McLean used to say that algebra and homotopy do not mix well. What did he, what did he mean by, by, by that sentence? Well, let's just change a little bit the equivalence that we consider among uh, chain complexes. Here, this is the strong equivalence. Now I want a weak one, like at the beginning. Okay, so what were we doing when we were doing topology? We we're considering the homotopy equivalence. Okay, here let me consider one, the deformation retract. And on the dollar chain complex, it gives me what is on this box on the, on the right-hand side. So what do I have? I have a chain complex AD, a chain complex HDH, chain maps, a homotopy for the composite P and I. Okay, I asked nothing so far for the other composite. Of course, previously this was zero. Okay, now it's different from zero. And now does the previous theorem survive? Let's check. 
we transfer the structure. We have a map I, we have a map P, fair enough. Ah, it's not associative, and, but it's not associative. Why? For a very good reason, because if I try to reproduce the same proof, here I'm going to plug P and I, but now it's different from the identity. It is just homotopic to the identity. This is still equal to that, but here, when I want to go from here to here, this is not equal, but there is a homotopy. So the drawback is, when you have an algebraic structure sitting on something, here a chain complex, and you deform it, you deform the algebraic structure. That's what McLean meant, I think, when he said that algebra and homotopy do not mix well a priori. Okay. Again, you can view that as a, as a failure and say, okay, I would never mix algebra and homotopy. I give up. I'm going to do analysis, PD, whatsoever. Or you can stick a little bit and say, okay, 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 okay. Life is not straightforward, but maybe there is something subtle and, and interesting to study here. Yes, there is. Look, okay, this is not zero, but this is not far from being zero. I have homotopies which go from here to here and from here to here. Well, let me be very naive and let me consider this formula. Okay, instead of considering the tree naively, I'm putting an H. You see, I'm labeling, I'm applying H at the internal edge. Okay, bon, fair enough. And then you remember I had these two trees, the left comb and the right comb, with H here and H here. Okay, fair enough. Well, you will not be very much surprised when I say that this measures the failure of the associativity of two because. This guy is actually a homotopy for the associativity. So you see, this, this transferred product here is not associative. The associator is not zero. Well, but still, I can control that. The associator is equal to D of something. Okay. So it tells you, for instance, that if I were working with cochains and cohomology, on cohomology, this guy is zero, and this gives me zero okay but gives me zero because there is this this homotopy here well because d is zero actually so it's bad reason anyway so what i'm saying is that when i want to do the homotopy transverse theorem through def retract instead of just iso the transfer product is not associative but i can control that with a new higher guy of rt3 cool and now since you're not lazy and you're quite cunning you say hey uh, do mu2 and mu3 satisfy a certain relation? Oh, so for instance, for those of you who have seen the, the Tamari lattice and the Stashev polytope, eh ben yes, alors mu3 is a homotopy. Yes, you can continue further. Why, why stop? Here I considered planar binary trees with three inputs. I could take the same formula, the very same formula, with planar binary trees with four inputs, fair enough. You label the inputs by I, you label the output by P, and you label all the internal edges by H. Okay. And then you check what do they satisfy. It turns out that they satisfy this. Alors, you, you could be afraid, you should not. Let's try to understand what it means. Okay. Uh, for instance, if you look at N equals three, this is nothing but the formula I wrote before. Okay, for n equals 3, the derivative of the operation n, alors it usually for any n, it is the sum of all the possible ways to compose two guys. There are signs, there are blah, 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 but forget about that. Okay, bon. for n equals 3, the only possibility on the right hand side is that I can only have a binary guy above, a binary guy below, attached to the left or attached to the right which gives me exactly this formula, okay? Now higher up, for n equals four, you have a corolla with four inputs here, and here you're gonna have five components, okay? Either you consider the binary guy below and a ternary guy above at the two places, or the ternary guy below and the binary guy at the three possible places, and these are the edges of the stash of polytope. I should have drawn one since it is a beautiful thing. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that with respect to this homotopy transfer theorem, each time that you start with an associative algebra A and you give yourself a deformation retract to H, 
You can consider mu2, mu3, etc. with the formula I gave before, sum over planar binary trees, blah, blah, blah. And they satisfy this relation. So they form an infinity algebra. So you see, we started from associative algebra. We perturbed the underlying guy. And what we got here is something quite big. And now it's made up of a full collect infinite collection of, of, of operations. And it's called an infinity algebra. Th does this have already have applications? Yes, and you know some of them. Okay. Uh, if you consider, for instance, the singular cochains on a space, let's let's say yeah, here you take a field for coefficients. It can work for a ring, but you need uh, that this guy is a free module, this guy is a free module. Anyway, you need to write the cohomology as a def retract of the cochains. This is why I took a field. Okay. So when I have a field, this is always possible. You make choice of representative of the cohomology groups. Oh, so you have the cup product on A, you have a def retract, so you can transfer something meaningful on the cohomology. So these guys, the transferred guys, are the massy products. Actually, there's a subtlety here, it's the lifting of massy products. So if you've never seen massy product, you forget the subtlety. Good. And what can you do with this? For instance, you can, first application, it can be done first in a different way, but you can detect the non-triviality of the Borromean rings with this. Mu3 is not zero, so they are not trivial. It's nowadays very much used in Galois cohomology and in, in elliptic curves, for instance, infinity structure. But there are many other examples. So other ones that you know, may know, and here you need a refinement, which is called curve the infinity algebra, but forget. When Fukaya, O, Ota, and Ono try to define uh, the floor cohomology for pairs of Lagrangians and manifold in any possible, I mean, they do not need to intersect, um, uh, what's that, uh, in, in, a non, in a trivial way. Uh, they, don't, they don't need to be transverse. Uh, then they came up with a infinity algebra. And if you start from a category and I change the, the set of arrows by a chain complex, I mean, a vector space of a rose or a chain complex of a rose, you can use these way to relax the associativity to give a notion of a infinity categories. So it would be categories where your set of a rose are chain complex and they do not compose strictly, they compose up to all these homotopies. And this is what Fukaya, or oh, I should have written the name of Fukaya again. This is uh, what Fukaya very much considered. And this give, gave rise, you see, why I mentioned this is because if you do not know what an infinite category, Konsejevich would not have been able to formulate his homological mirror symmetry conjecture. So that's what I mean, that these higher structures are mandatory both to formulate the exact statement you are looking for, otherwise you cannot, and to prove it. So it's going to give you a language and methods at the same time. Alors, I said when we have, when we start from an associative algebra, we transfer, we get an infinity algebra. Is it stable now? You can play with this. I mean, you can say, oh, hey, now I start from an infinity algebra. Do I get an AA infinity algebra or what do I get? No, actually, you, you've reached a, a notion which is already homotopy stable. So I don't want to, uh, you should not learn by heart all the formulas I'm going to show, but I just want to say that if you start from an infinity algebra, new two, new three, etc., now you do not consider, you still consider planar trees, but not necessarily binary. You can also plug here new two, new three, etc., and it works in exactly the same way. Okay, so what you have to remember from this slide is not the formula for sure, but is that infinity algebras are good for homotopy. They are homotopy stable. Well, then we, we keep playing with categories and in categories, the rows are interesting. In other words, if you transfer an infinity algebra structure, you had a quasi-iso I from H to A. Uh -huh. Is this a row preserved? I mean, does this a row preserve the structure? So now I want to consider what, what kind of maps do I want between a infinity algebras? And I'm going to reach a good definition with the homotopy transfer theorem again. And I like this example because you can give it to any student and any student can find the notion of the infinity algebra. So I was a chain map. So it commutes with D, the first C structure. Does it commute with the product? Already, huh? 
I mean, does I commute with the transferred product and the original product, say? No. No, not in general, for the same reason as before. If you drew the, the picture, you will see that, no, it doesn't work for the very same reason. But also for the very same reason, you are going to see how you can have a homotopy between mu2 i and i and mu2. And these homotopies have this shape. You should not be too much surprised because if you look, these are the exact same trees as we had before. Planar trees labeled by i at the input, h at the edge. The only thing which changes before we were doing this here and we were coming back in the end with a p here. Have a look. Oh, no, I should not go too quickly. See, there was a p here. Now, no. We have to stay in a. So how do we stay in a? We apply h. Bon. And to tell me, okay, you can consider this complicated formula, but why? Because this formula satisfies a relation, okay? So the relation is what? If you do a higher mu and a certain f, it is equal to applying f and then mu, which is somehow what you want to do higher up. Write this equation for n equals 2. I mean, with two inputs, what do you get? You get that you're going to do the product, mu2, and then f1, that is i here before. Or you do f1, f1, and then you do this, okay? So this gives you a definition of an infinite morphism. If you have never seen that before, forget all I said. Just keep in mind that there are some phenomena appearing when I mix algebra and homotopy. And the good notion of algebra is collection of operations. Good notion of morphism, collection of operations. And if you want to have a faithful image in your head, keep in mind that this collection, you might view them as Taylor series. And Taylor series behave well. For instance, a Taylor series which begins with a guy which is invertible is invertible. And this is exactly what is going to happen here. And that's why this word behaves in a much better way. That's it. So the I am satisfied that. And here it is. Now, you see the drawback of quasi-isomorphisms. They are not necessarily invertible. Infinity, quasi-iso, yes, they are. So I just gave you the full statement of the homotopy transfer theorem. You start from an infinity algebra here. There is an infinity algebra here, such that I and P extend to A infinity quasi-isomorphism because I and P were quasi-isomorphism. And H can be extended into an A infinity homotopy. So here now, there is no loss of algebra homotopy called data. You started from a certain data, and you have one which is homotopy equivalent because it is related by maps which are good equivalents. So you, you should like this theorem, and it tells you why this is very uh, universal. So the two reasons why I like this, this kind of guy is that, okay, infinity quasi-isomorphism behaves very well. They admit homotopy inverse. And it tells you that when you look at the derived category, the homotopy category of diffusion graded associative algebra, so you localize with respect to quasi-iso, then this is completely equivalent to you take the same objects, diffusion graded associative algebras. But now you consider their infinity morphism, and this is a modest homotopy relation, it's not a localization. So you really want something doing this, okay? So it allows you, you see, to simplify the homotopy category. So it shows you why uh, infinity morphism are good, okay? So here is just one slide, and, and you, should, you should be happy, I think. Um, I will not go into the details of the operator calculus. I just want to tell you that what I explained to you before works for everybody. Okay, and there is a machinery which does this for you. Okay, why? And this maybe will answer the, the question that was raised before. All I just said before, there was no word operator, A infinity, I should know, but there are, of course, operas there. First, you need to work with DG operas, that is, operas with chain complexes. Okay, and then uh, what can you do? Well, you might want to model the category of associative algebras with an operad. Sure, you take a free operad. T means for tree, because the free operad is given by tree. So you take free, remove the T. Think that what is an associative algebra? It's given by a binary product, which satisfies blah, blah, blah. How do you encode that? With a quotient operad, 
free operate by a product, mode out by the associated relation. And I mean, if you've been doing a little bit of homological algebra, you know that cosets, quotients, behave badly with respect to uh, derivation of functor, etc. And what you need to do is to replace them, so to find something which is quasi-isomorphic, to uh, something which is projective. And very often, when we have projective modules, we try to find free modules. It's exactly the same thing here, except we are not working in an abelian category, and this exists. We have to work uh, with model categories and total derived functors. So, but the heuristic is definitely the same. Associative algebras do not behave well up to a motor P because they are modeled by a quotient operat. But A infinity algebras behave well because they are modeled by a free cofibrant projective replacement. That is the heuristic. And there is a machinery to do this in full generality that is called causality theory for the G operas. So let me show you what do you have. So now, tomorrow when you're going to wake up, you're going to, to go back to your uh, Re research paper you've been writing uh, for six months, and maybe you have a certain category of algebras that you like with three products, I don't know. So let me call that a category of algebra of type P. Maybe you should consider doing the following thing. Your category of algebra, try to coin the operat which encodes it. This category of algebra might not have nice homotopical properties for a good reason, because this operat is not free. So replace this operat by a quasi-free one. Replace meaning you should have a quasi-iso here. It should be quasi-free, so that is cofibrant projective whatsoever. And then, since you have a morphism of operat here, you know that this category sits inside that one. So this one is bigger. And because this guy is cofibrant, it has nice homotopy properties. This is the, the heuristic, OK? It, so it always works. Over the last 20, 30 years, we've been developing many, many ways to find these minimal resolutions. They are functorial ones, but they are huge, Barkobar. You have minimal ones, Kozul, you have uh, inhomogeneous ones, etc., etc. But nearly all the examples I saw people working with, Lee algebras, cumulative algebras, Gessner algebras, batanin vilkovsky Lee by algebras, Fobenius by algebras, double Poisson algebras, for all of them, uh, we have the minimal model for, for all who are written there. So for all of them, all the results I mentioned before on the A-infinity case hold. Homotopy transfer theorem, infinity quasi-iso, etc., etc. So if you have in your, in, your, in your work kind of structures like this, that's means very good. We have the tools to, to handle their, their homotopy theories. Okay. May I ask uh, question? May I ask sure, sure. Question. So about the previous slide, yes. So, well, Yes. My opinion in this example, in the list of operates, one uh, thing, namely lead by algebras, is not an operate, right? Thank you. The, the last three ones are not operates. And that's why you see I put this pr before operates on the, on the last. Uh, no, 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 no. Probenius is sort of operate. Why not? Well, no, okay. but, 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 but no, I, I mean, only lead by algebras are not an operate. Alors, okay, alors. Let's, let me say two things. First, for those who are not as, uh, as, as expert as you are, if you look at the Lie by algebra, it has a co-product. So it has uh, several outputs. Operas have only one output. So yes, you need to work with props or properas whatsoever, for which we have causal duality. Then to address uh, and your, your second question, I wrote Frobenius. I can consider two kind of Frobenius things. The Frobenius algebra with an invariant product, and this is modeled by a cyclic opera. Or Frobenius by algebras, because using the inner product, I can turn my, my, my product into a coproduct. And this is Frobenius by algebras. And actually, Frobenius by algebras are causal dual to Lie by algebras, I mean, with involutivity, anyway. So thank you for your remark. For those who are not as expert as you are, keep in mind that I've been just discussing operads. But if you have a fancy algebraic structure, we have other versions of operas which can handle several outputs, several colors, loops, wheels, trace, etc. Does it answer you. your question, thank you. Boris? Thank you. thank you, thank you. Ask ask questions like this, otherwise I'm going too fast. Can I ask I'm one hiding. more question, please? Uh, of course. So, uh, so what is for you exactly a causal operator? Oh no, intuitively a causal operator. So that's a kind of operator where there is a kind of causal duality going on. That's what you said. 
Alors, OK. Uh, two, two, maybe at least two, two answers. First one is, in this setting, right? You, you give me an opera, the DG opera. I can always find a, a quasi-free resolution. But it, I, mm -hmm. I know a functorial one, which is called, which is the Bormann forked one in spirit, but in the DG case, we call it bar cobar. So we apply uh -huh. two functors, yeah. bar and cobar. But this one is huge and it's definitely not minimal. There is an internal differential on the, on the space of generators. And sometimes, mm -hmm. well, we are either lazy or we want things to be more uh, canonical. Mm -hmm. We try to find the minimal model, like in rational homotopy theory. So mm -hmm. we want to find a smaller resolution and say very quickly, a causal, an opera is causal when this bar cobar resolution can be simplified. Okay. Okay. In, okay. And in, inside the bar construction of an opera sits another opera or cooperad whatsoever. Okay. And, and if that cooperad is quasi isomorphic to the bar, you're super happy. You can use this causal dual instead of the bar and you get something smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then causal duality, so you take an opera, it produces another one, and then you have nice uh, morphisms between the two, which produces nice functors yeah. between the, the categories. If you think at rational homotopy theory, you have nice functors between Lie algebras, coalgebras, and commutative algebras or coalgebras. This is conceptually explained by the, by the causal duality theory on the level of opera. Okay. Yeah, okay. I see. It answers your question? Yes, I think so. Yes, thank you. So, sorry, I have no time to make things, everything no, explicit no, 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 here. Course. No, no, But, but the, the idea is to say, if you understood what's going on with the infinity algebras, don't be afraid. We have developed uh, the same kind of things for other uh, of the guys. Okay. okay. Yes, I'm trying to and in that understand everything from the point of view of our infinity algebra. So thank you, but this clarified things. Okay. <laughs> the causal dual, for instance, of the operad as is as itself. That okay. is why bar cobar between algebras lands in associative coalgebras. This uh, Adams and uh, uh, McLean construction. Okay. Anyway, uh, last slide on the operatic calculus. And if we have time, we'll move on to, to deformation theory. But you tell me. I wanted to say that uh, you see the homotopy transfer theorem. We have chain complex, a structure on it, and we consider its homology. I don't know you, but for me, this is a situation I experienced, uh, I don't know how many times in my, in my life. This is ubiquitous. You find that everywhere. And so the homotopy transfer theorem should be everywhere. It is everywhere. So I have very few time here, but spectral sequences, their definition and convergence is the homotopy transfer theorem for mixed complexes. The definition of cyclic homology, cones, bicomplex, and churn characters is the homotopy transfer theorem. The formality statements is the vanishing of the transferred structure. The Feynman diagrams that you have in renormalization theory, these are exactly the formulas of the homotopy transfer theorem for a particular kind of algebraic structure. So, etc., etc. It is very likely that if you have a perturbative uh, formula in your domain, which has the shape of a certain Taylor series of blah, 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 it smells like the homotopy transfer theorem. Uh, you see, for instance, yes, this one. If you look at the definition of the cumulants in non-commutative probability theory, they are infinity morphisms for certain algebraic structures. So, wow. So, this is a very universal algebra. And I will finish this slide uh, with the, the conclusion of the, the Poincaré program about the faithful algebraic invariance for topological spaces, because it has been solved, though we don't know how to compute the homotopy group of spheres. Okay, I said that on the singular cohomology, we had a commutative structure, but there was a shadow, okay? This was the shadow of, of higher structure. We saw that, okay, the associativity was holding on the level of the co-chains, but not the commutativity. And we saw the first obstruction to commutativity, say. So first, there is a notion of a relaxed notion of commutative algebra, where you relax both associativity and commutativity. This is, strictly speaking, not produced by causal duality theory. Or you need something a bit more. And we call that E infinity because we relax everything up to homotopy. For example, and it's a non-trivial result, it's the opposite of the homotopy transfer, if you want. There was a shadow on the cohomology. We want to lift it on the co-chain. So it's the opposite direction to homotopy transfer. On the singular co-chain, you have an E infinity algebra, okay? And you take your favorite model for E infinity, Baratekers, surjection operat, whatsoever. 
and the theorem is now you take the functor which sends topological spaces to this E infinity algebra solution, I mean, through this cochain, uh, singular cochain functor. It turns out that the homotopy category of topology, again, this is for you, Boris, I put some, okay, I, I cheated, and there are assumptions that I don't want to write. So the homotopy category of topological spaces embeds inside the homotopy category of the infinity algebra with respect to the quasi iso. So here, that's it, that's it. We have reached a rich enough algebraic structure which contains faceful invariance of the homotopy type. Well, now, uh, I don't want you to be uh, too happy over the, over the rest of the weekend, say. Uh, this will not compute the homotopy group of spheres, etc. You've, you've, you've exchanged an extremely difficult problem for an extremely more difficult problem, okay? The infinity algebra structure on the singular cochain, blah, 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 it's amazingly difficult, okay? But still, but still it is the first time that you have algebraic invariance, phase three invariance of the homotopy type. That's it. Okay, so here, uh, I, I, yeah. So I have a question, sorry, Bruno. <laughs> Go. Okay, uh, <laughs> this is probably an advanced question, but so the E infinity is not the minimum model for the the operat com. No. It's, it's, no. it's a more, it's more, co it's not minimal, it will be also co-fibrant replacement. No, no, wait, I, 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 hold, on, hold, on, hold on, it can be minimal. So yeah, I answered too fast. The, yeah. the, formal, the, the formal definition of E infinity is you want a sigma co-fibrant replacement of COM. So you want an operad, which is quasi-isomorphic to COM, but those action of the symmetry group, if you want, is free, is projected. Okay. Then you can ask more, you can, you can ask that this operad is free. And is minimal. Uh, you can, but uh, nobody has coined the minimal model of COM over Z uh, so far. Uh, so it's, ah, it's, an it's extremely not C infinity. It's not C infinity. It's, it's E infinity. Yes, I mean C infinity. That was produced by 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 the causal duality theory. So yeah. C infinity. Uh, give me a second. See, I, I mentioned it here. Okay, here. You take for granted the commutativity. You take it and you do not deform it. You do not relax it. The only thing you relax up to homotopy is the associativity. And this is the kind of structure you have in rational homotopy theory, okay? But here, when you want to work over Z and not Q, you need also, because you want the Steenroth squares, etc., etc., you need also to have the higher homotopies for the commutativity. Yeah. And having higher homotopies for both, it turns out to be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's okay. Cause, okay. Yeah, because is E infinity a single operator, or I, I thought I saw like multiple models for it. No, no, you're right. E formally, I mean, even people call E infinity any uh, replacement, blah blah blah, of us. But yeah. okay, it's also it's also the case for E infinity. So. But what happened is that for A infinity, there was the minimal model, the minimal one, unique up to ISO. So why should we consider yes. other ones? I have good reasons to consider Barkoba in some cases, I can tell you, but not now. It, for, for E infinity, same thing. You, 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 the first definition is sigma cofibrant replacement of COM. And then you ask yourself to have a, a, a very canonical one. But it turns out that the surjection operator is good, but the Baratekers is also good. But the, you see, so yeah. uh, so nobody yeah. has the minimum model so far. Uh, I've been working on that. I can tell you. Uh, right. <laughs> so yeah. this 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 is an extremely difficult question. Yeah, it, it's puzzling that it doesn't fit into the causal duality. Uh, Sort of. I, I, yeah, I said it. But you see, this is a statement I don't like to, to, to make. It's not a mathematical statement. It does not sit inside causal duality. What happens? I mean, in, in three years, you will come with a beautiful paper saying, no, Bruno, look, if you look at things like this and like that, and etc. Uh, okay. I remember uh, Jean-Louis Laudet, my PhD advisor, uh, telling me the story about cyclic homology. Is that a derived functor? And people were looking, were looking, and, and Jean-Louis was a good friend with, uh, with Alain Cohn. They were together in, in Ecole Normale. And one day, Cohn comes and he says, of course, it's a derived functor, but you have to change your definition and, and to consider uh, categories like this, that, that, and that. So let's be open-minded, okay? Right now, okay. it does not, it is not produced by the classical causal duality theory of Ginsburg, Kapranov, Gester-Jones, if you want, 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so now oh, you're welcome. Time. Thank you to ask questions. Otherwise, I would speak. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm addressing to the organizers. Uh, tell me, I mean, I have maybe five or six slides for this. If you want me to stop, I can, or if you tell me, what should I do for the higher Lee theory? I think, I mean, we started uh, like five past, so you would have still seven minutes or even a bit longer because we didn't plan the next talk until quarter past, so. Oh, okay. And, I, could, and now... I could make a comment, Bruno. Yes, please. <laughs> Um, if 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 um, if perhaps in that little little comment that you made before you, you want to give people hope, if you change Z for Q, then then things work, right? <laughs> yes, yes, that's what I was saying. If you change Z for Q, then causal duality is doing that for you. Yes, sure, sure. But Q is a bit boring with respect if you compare to. By the way, okay. And now, yeah, say say. Yeah. If there is if there is any question, ask them. Sure. I mean. This yeah. Is, yeah. This so question talk, question. Yeah. So then I think that actually about this e infinity, there is indeed some question, as a conceptual. So why we so very often in oh, everywhere actually e infinity is defined not as a free resolution of the operate comb, but uh, at the first look on which a little bit weaker, right? So we just hmm? require. Yeah. Yeah. A symmetric group uh, to act free on each component, but I guess that this is actually interesting. That basically this is cofibrant, right? Is it correct? So I think that there is a closed model structure on DG operates uh, in uh, constructed in a paper of Clemens Berger and Ike Murdaik. and then I guess that there is something about this issue. So then actually we, it's cofibrant, or at least. No. No, no, no. Let me tell you the subtlety. First, let's take the following definition. An E infinity operad is a sigma cofibrant resolution. Yeah, sigma so cofibrant. It is an operad. You forget the operadic structure. Just the action of the symmetric group is projective of cofibrant. Why is that good enough for you? It is good enough to provide the category of E infinity algebras with a modeled category structure. Okay, now mm -hmm. this is the first thing. Now, yes, we can we can also ask the question as you are. There is a model category structure on, on Operad. Um, I think it goes back to Spitzweg, Kinich, etc. A Berger Murdoch, sure. Then you can ask, oh now my E infinity operad, I could ask that it is stronger, cofibrant. If it is cofibrant, it is sigma cofibrant. So it is a, a strictly stronger um, assumption. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. You see, so, so for it being sigma cofibrant ensures that your category of algebras has a model category structure. And now you can ask another question on another level for the category of DG operad itself. Can I find an E infinity operad which is sigma cofibrant? Yes, yes, sure. You take Barcobar of your of any sigma, take Barcobar of any E infinity operad. It is a cofibrant E infinity operad. Yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So uh, maybe everybody's, I mean, if there are people who are lost, feel free to ask questions. I mean, let me stop. I mean, there's no point going further if people have, have more questions. It would be better that we understand this and not go, not go further. So is there any other question? No, Ali, I continue. I have a question. Oh, sorry, I stop. Go. Regarding a whitehead theorem that um, if it's an isomorphism on uh, higher fundamental groups, then it is an uh, homotopy equivalence. Uh -huh. uh, so that tells us that uh, the higher homotopy groups form a conservative family, I guess, mm -hmm. but maybe not the faithful one. But, but you're working on CW complexes. Okay, so the point is that here it yeah. works in much higher generality. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. No, not yes, definitely. Yeah, the, the topological spaces do not necessarily have the homotopy type of a CW complex. Yeah, yes. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So what did I want to say? Uh, it, maybe I should just mention this higher Lee thing to to just to motivate you to go in this direction, but not to recall everything. I just wanted to say that there is classical Lie theory where you produce a Lie group out of a Lie algebra 
And this is based on a universal formula called the becker campbell hausdorff formula. So for those of you who've never seen that, this is this, the logarithm of the product of the exponential. And underlying any exponential map in Lie theory, you have this formula. For any Lie algebra, I put complete because this guy is an infinite series, so I want the convergence of that, okay? So I can form a group, that's it. And then uh, I just wanted to, to, to recall the, um, the philosophy of deformation theory with deflation graded Lie algebras. As soon as you have a differential graded Lie algebra, there's a very beautiful formula I like to call it the more cartan equation. It's definitely related to uh, connections and more cartan stuff, but it's also called the master equation in physics, etc. And then you can integrate the degree zero part of this Lie algebra. You get a group, and it turns out that this group acts on the more cartan element. And this very universal picture because uh, it turns out that. Now, each time you have a deformation problem, so this is why it's called a philosophy, and it remained a philosophy for quite a long time, due to Alain, Trottenbeek, Delin, uh, Drinfeld, many, many people, Schlesinger, Stachef, etc. I'm forgetting many people. Any deformation problem over a field of characters D0 can be encoded by a DGD algebra. In which way? Say you have a deformation problem. You have an underlying space and some structure that you want to detect on it. The structures should be in one one correspondence with your more carton guys. And the equivalence relation you're going to consider on the structure should be encoded by this Hausdorff group. And you know at least two examples of this. The Orchid cochain complex of A with the Gastenaber bra bracket is a B algebra. More carton elements are associative algebras or A infinity if you change the, the grading. And then if you integrate the, 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 the degree one part, the degree zero part, that is the RIT one part, you get isomorphisms. Another example that you know, if you look at uh, Poisson structures of two different morphisms, this is the, the, the polyvector fields which produce this for you. So there are many, many examples for which this works. But why does it work? And, and this is what is interesting, and I'm going to stop on this, that this was solved. So I wanted to mention Kansevich theorem, but let me skip that. Kansevich proved the conjecture, which is the deformation quantization of Poisson manifold. Why I mention it is because he used uh, homotopical algebra. He coined an L infinity quasi iso. So you see, to prove this, and maybe that was the, that was the first time where infinity morphism was proved to be so great. To prove this statement, which has nothing to do with opera or or even homotopy theory, it just it's just purely algebraic. You put your hands into this stuff. So here, to prove it, you need well, you need. You, you can consider these higher structures, okay? And I just want to finish this by saying that this, this philosophy that goes back to, to the oh, 60s, 70s, was made into a theorem. Why and how? First, you, you're going, you, have, you should complain, A, if my Lie algebra G is not complete, the gauge group does not make sense. So the idea is to look at the functor from Artinian ring and then you just keep the maximal ideal and you take the tensor product with this maximal ideal. Since this guy is nilpotent, this Lie algebra is nilpotent and all my formulas are finite. Cool. And of course, I can play with the, with the size of this guy. It can be amazingly big, so it can cover everything here. Okay. Is considering such functor enough for the philosophy? No. Schlesinger tried very hard, no way. Okay, so what do we need? We need to consider higher stuff on the right-hand side. Okay, why is that a groupoid? We have a set on which a group acts. So the objects are this set, and the rows are these isomorphisms. But is it the picture that we have? No, we, we do not have just points and, and, uh, and uh, the, the rows of the groupoid. Sometimes we, can, we have two rows, so these two in blue, and we have two ways to compare them. And maybe we want to compare the comparison. Ah, what a nightmare. But you see here, it's the same Pandora's box. We have to consider infinite higher guys. Bon. And the idea is to coin a certain notion of an infinity groupoid. And the heuristic, which is a Grothendieck homotopy hypothesis, if we want to be pedantic, is to say that an infinity groupoid should be like a topological space that is a Kahn complex. Bon, I should go short here. 
account complex is a certain simplicial set. And the idea is that it models well higher categories. And there is a way to improve, there is a way to improve the deformation uh, functor we had before, but putting something which is very much simplicial, you are going to tensor your Lie algebra with a commutative algebra, say Lie algebra, and tensor it again with a simplicial commutative algebra that comes from Sullivan rational homotopy theory. And then the beautiful result of Vinich is says that the moror carton locus of this is an infinity groupoid. And it gives you all the data of your Lie algebra G. And now what, what Pridham and Lurie did, they said among these functors which goes from DG, and then there's this passage to the DG world, to infinity groupoid, there are sums which are called formal moduli problems. This is a good definition of what we said before, a deformation problem. And they proved very recently that there is an equivalence of infinity categories between formal moduli problems, deformation problems, and the GD algebras. So this is uh, somehow uh, the upshot of this deformation theory. And if you are interested, and this is my last slide, in each fontes is, is actually too huge because differential forms is too infinite dimensional. So you don't have, all, you have all the gauges, but, but many, many more. It was refined by Getzler uh, by means of a gauge, uh, a gauge restriction. Uh, and here now the groupoid is an algebraic groupoid. That is when you are filling the horns, you have it in a canonical way. And if you play a little bit with Getzler's integration, and you look at the horn here, we put 0, 0, 0, an element of your Lie algebra, an element of your Lie algebra, okay? Then you fill it by 0. What you get here is the becker campbell hausdorff formula. So what I found absolutely beautiful is that algebraic topology gives you Lie theory. Filling the first horn gives you the universal formula of, of, uh, of Lie theory. Wow. Bon. And uh, okay, now a small advertisement. Um, we've been studying that very much with Robert, Daniel Robert Nicou. It's uh, my last preprint on the archive. So there are nice pictures there. So don't read the text, look at the pictures. And so that's why we were interested into this. We wanted this higher, uh, higher Lie theory. And we produced several results by considering this higher BCH formula for which we have explicit and effective formulas. It's not just it exists. We have formulas in terms of sum of trees, etc. So if you're interested, feel free to, to ask me any questions. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention.